So I appreciate that prayer. Good morning, folks. Uh, it's certainly good to be here and to have the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I remember when I was growing up, when we had the chance to go down and visit my grandparents that lived down in southeast New Mexico, a little town called Lovington, New Mexico. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of it. But a couple of things that I remember about going to visit them, especially as a little child. Running across the back of the yard was this old wood fence. And this was one of those wood fences that had a wide top on it. I mean, it was wide enough you could crawl on top and you could walk or run down it. I'm not saying that was the smart thing to do, but you could. Right in the middle of the yard, just on the back side of that fence, was a big tree. And in that tree was a pretty nice tree house. Now, ours wasn't quite as nice with this. Ours didn't have any sides on it. It was just an old wooden platform about seven or eight feet in the air. There was also an old wooden playhouse that we could get in a tree and get up on the roof on, or it had rafters in it you could swing in and climb on. There was a horse barn out back and a corral. And there was an old garage that, for kids, had a lot of cool stuff in it. And I remember that all the cousins, all the kids, that we would play outside most of the day and sometimes most of the night. We would be up in the trees and the tree house, climbing on that fence, playing in the barn. There was a lot of hide and seek that was played in those days. And needless to say, playing around all that wood, getting splinters in our hands and our feet was a very common occurrence. But I want to tell you about my grandpa. My grandpa was a real cowboy. I even think he had a real cowboy name. It was Hob, H-O-B. Now, he used to go on cattle roundups, and way before my time, he rode in the sheriff's posse. I don't think he had a pair of shoes that weren't cowboy boots. And I liked one thing, that when it rained, Grandpa would stand outside under the eave of the garage and just watch it rain, because to him, rain was such a precious commodity. But another thing about my grandpa that you need to know is he always carried a pocket knife. Now, I remember when those of us that were young got our first splinter. You come running into the house, and naturally your first thought is, where's mom or where's granny? But you see down here, when they look down and they see that splinter, they say, go see grandpa. So you go to grandpa, he pulls you up on his knee, and then he leans over and he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out that pocket knife. Now you're thinking tweezers or something. No, grandpa pulls out a pocket knife. And this is not a baby pocket knife. This is, you know, a crocodile Dundee knife. <laughs> not really, but it's a good sized knife. But you sit there and your eyes are really big because you see that knife. But you know, everybody tells you that that splinter needs to come out. Because if it doesn't come out, your hand's gonna get infected and it's gonna fall off. But you see this knife, and you're debating whether or not that's worth the risk. You know, maybe I'd rather suffer through the pain of the splinter than actually have it cut out. But this was not Grandpa's first time to use a knife. And when you finally work up the nerve to let him have your hand, you know, you cover your hand like this because you only want him to get the little bit. But when you finally work up the nerve to let him have your hand, I can't explain how, but somehow he takes that pocket knife and he's able to work that splinter back out. And when he works it out, you know, he's got that little piece sitting on the end of that blade and you look at it and you think, wow, he was able to get that out and even save the finger. And then you wonder, how could something that small cause so much pain? But you're glad it's gone. Well, I, for one, I think uh, the world could use a whole lot more grandpas that are good with a pocket knife like that. But have you ever noticed that as we get older, our splinters get a little bigger? We put our hands or our feet somewhere they shouldn't be. We say or do something that we shouldn't have done. And then sometimes uh, the pain or the infection sets in from that poor decision. And I think sometimes that some of us have been willing to walk through life carrying that infection with us because we're too scared to let it get cut out. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Galatians chapter 6. We're going to get there in just a minute. 
But I think most of us would agree that at least metaphorically speaking, Paul was pretty good with a knife. I think he was good at seeing the problem in an individual or in a community and then helping them see what it was going to take to repair that problem, what it was going to take to restore that relationship, either with each other or with God. We've already seen in his letter to the churches in Galatia that Paul's had to deal with some pretty significant splinters. I mean, we read of false teaching and hypocrisy and discrimination, broken promises, alienation, conflict. And then, of course, we get to the big list. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, and orgies. And then don't you like when Paul ends the list with, and the like. It's like any other behavior that is not godlike. You can go ahead and add that to the list. But since the beginning of this letter, Paul has been contrasting this life under the law with this life under the Spirit, this life under Christ. And then when we get to the second half of chapter 5, uh, he starts to tell his audience what this life in Christ, what this life lived by the Spirit really looks like. And in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 5, we read a passage we're all familiar with. It says, to serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes on to contrast then the works of the flesh with the works of the Spirit. We read that list of the works of the flesh in one paragraph, and right underneath it we, lead, we read the list on the fruits of the Spirit. But this brings us up to chapter 6, where he provides some directives for how this life lived in Christ, how this life lived by the Spirit might actually play out. What would this look like? Read with me beginning in verse 1 of chapter 6. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each one should test their own actions, then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. Have you ever felt like you needed to say something to someone? You know, there was something in their behavior, in their speech, that just didn't feel right. They did something, they said something, and, and it just didn't sit right with you. And you felt like, you know, I need to go talk to them. But you didn't. And then that begins to eat on us a little bit, because we realize, you know, maybe I should have gone up and talked to them. But I think it's important for us to see that Paul is establishing here a requirement, an expectation that we will go to each other and to restore each other. This word restore means to make complete, to mend, uh, to unite. You get this idea of repair, of making something whole again. Restoration is a good thing. Now we're familiar with passages like Matthew 18 where if a brother has sinned against us, we're to go to them directly, just the two of us. And it says that if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Or how about James 5, beginning in verse 19? It talks about bringing back a brother or a sister who has wandered from the truth. And it says, whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death. You see, this is not just simply an opportunity to go point out the wrong in someone's life. If that's what we get from this text, then we're really missing the point. This is an opportunity to love that person. This is an opportunity to be about the Lord's work of restoring relationships. Restoring relationships with each other and restoring a relationship between the father and his child. But we might uh, start by asking ourselves, who actually can do that? 
Who's qualified to do this? Because I think Paul says not everyone is. He says, you who live by the Spirit. Now remember, this is coming right on the heels of his discussion about the fruits of the Spirit, about living a life guided by the Spirit. Just because we are able to see the sin in someone's life does not automatically qualify us to help them remove that sin from their life. The Spirit is involved in this process. And if we have no relationship with the Spirit, if we have no relationship with the Word of God, then what would make us think we are qualified to help someone else through this process? Now, I like the fact that Paul has laid this foundation, once again, for what it's like to live in Christ. This life that's evident from the fruits of the Spirit. And now he shows us exactly why that's required and how we're going to put it to use. The only ones qualified to even attempt this restoration project are those in whom you see the fruits of the Spirit. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control. If we need someone to get near us with a knife, if I need somebody to get and cut something out of my body or cut something out that's infecting my soul, I want that person to not only have the right tools, but I want them to be good with using them. I want to know that that person has a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I want to know that that person is a student of God's Word. And I would like to know that that person has the scars from being through this process of restoration in their own life. And I think it would be wise that if a person like that, with that kind of heart, comes to me and says, we need to talk, it would be wise that I listen. And we need those kinds of Christians in our life. Now, if you're like me, you're sitting there thinking, well, this is not as easy as it sounds, and you are exactly right. This does not come naturally for us. Paul makes it clear that the, uh, the works of the flesh are in conflict with the works of the Spirit. And I think that's why he also gives us some warnings in this text. He says to watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. In verse 3, he says, If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. And in verse 4, he says that we should test our own actions. This process is ripe for mistakes. It is primed for our pride and our ego to get in the way. And it is ripe for us to, instead of going to somebody as a restorer, that we become an offender. There's training that we must undergo. There's learning that must take place. And there is some self-evaluation that we must be willing to go through. And this is all before we are qualified to do this. This ability, it's cultivated through time in the Word. It's cultivated through this relationship with the great physician. And it's cultivated through the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. But just in case, I think it's easy for us sometimes to sit there and think, well, I'm not qualified for this. That doesn't give us an out. We need to make sure that we are on the right page, on the same page as Paul is. We are called to help restore one another. This is not optional. And if we do not feel qualified, then brothers and sisters, I challenge us that we need to start working on it. A Christian that is aware of a brother or sister that is stumbling in sin does not pass by on the other side of the road. If I love you, I will do this. If you love me, you will do this. But Paul not only tells us the who that can do this, but he also tells us how this restoration process is to take place. He says, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Now, I think a more literal translation here, and one that's probably more in keeping with Paul's emphasis on the Spirit, would read, restore that person in a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness, one of the fruits of the Spirit Paul just talked about in the paragraph before. 
a character trait that is necessary for restoration. You see, the person that lives by the Spirit is full of humility. They recognize the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that have been extended to them. And thus, they in turn are willing to extend that to others. Now, if we approach restoration with anything but love and humility, we're not equipped to do this. I think about that, you know, before Jesus was arrested, he made a stop in the garden to pray. And we read in Matthew 26, he says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. In Luke 22, it says that being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus was in anguish, but he knew what had to take place, what had to happen for restoration to come about. And so he left the garden, and he went to the cross, because that was his Father's will, and because he loved us. Well, for us to try to restore a brother and sister, I think, requires a stop in the garden beforehand. We should anguish over this decision. This, the thought of doing this should be overwhelming to us. And we need the Spirit to help guide us. But when we realize that, we leave the garden and we go to restore our brother because it's the will of our Father and because we love each other. Now, as Paul moves into verse 2, uh, he talks about carrying each other's burdens, bearing each other's burdens. But Paul's not changing the subject here. He's telling us that we carry each other's burdens when we help restore each other. The word bear is the same one here that Paul uses over in Romans 15 when he calls on the strong to bear on the failings of the weak. You see, when we go to our brother, we don't just simply uh, pat him on the back and tell him that we're going to pray for him. No, like the Samaritan, we help them up and we stay with them until they get to the place they need to be spiritually. And the next time they fall, we do it again. Every time I see a brother or sister fall, I am to go to them, not to condemn them, but to help restore them. And I pray that I also have those same type of friends in my life. You see, when we live by the Spirit and we restore each other in a spirit of gentleness, and when we restore each other in a spirit of gentleness, it says that we fulfill the law of Christ. And that's the why of what Paul is calling us to do, to fulfill the law of Christ. See, I think the entire story of Scripture is about restoration. It's about a relationship that was severed by sin and a Messiah that came to restore that relationship. If I want to become like Christ, then I must be about the same mission that Christ was about. And I must be about restoring my brother and sister. But this is risky business. Because I tell you, it stresses me to think about how I would go to you without offending you. It bothers me even more about how I might react when you come to me to point out a sin in my life. You know, but the way I look at it, we only have two choices, folks. We can choose to remain comfortable. We can choose to keep our distance from each other, from the struggles and the sinfulness in each other's life. Or we can do what Scripture says. And we can live a life guided by the Spirit, and we can go to each other in a spirit of gentleness to help restore each other, to help turn each other away from sin and back to Christ. If we choose to remain comfortable, then church, will, church life will go on as usual. We'll continue to be pleasant and nice to each other. But if we choose to do what Paul is advocating, there's a chance things are going to get messy. 
Sin seems to cause a mess, to make a mess out of things. After all, it is easier to look the other way. It's easier to pass by on the other side of the road. There's a good chance that some members, some friends, may become offended in the process. There's a chance that some won't be able to tolerate the vulnerability, the exposure that's going to take place because of this. And let's not kid ourselves. Satan is going to do everything he can to convince us that it's not worth the risk. But I ask you, where did we ever get the idea that Christianity came with no risk? Where did we get the idea that this walk of a Christian life was easy, non-threatening? Because I read in Ephesians 6 that the Word is the sword of the Spirit. In Hebrews 4, it's alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. So then how is it that most of us walk around without even a scratch? How come our bodies are not covered in scars for the time that we had the sin cut out of our life? Is it possible to encounter the Word of God is it impossible or is it possible to engage the Holy Spirit and to come away unscathed? We tend to hold the Word at arm's length. We'll read it, but we really don't want it to get too close because then it might cut. I think we rarely speak of confession and repentance, sometimes even to God, much less to each other. We can think that we can keep each other at arm's reach, but somehow have God close. That's what I call so, uh, solo Christianity, which is really an oxymoron. It's not real. Not only do I need you to help me identify and remove the sin in my life, but I need to be preparing myself. I need to be training myself so that I can help you, so that I can minister to you. I need to be cultivating the fruits of the Spirit in my life that prepare me for this task. The first time my grandfather dug out his pocket knife to remove a splinter it was scary. But what was special about my grandfather was the delicate way that he could go about removing that splinter. He knew how much pressure to apply and where to apply it. He knew how to look at that splinter and figure out how it went in and how to get it out. If the skin needed to be opened up to expose that foreign object, he knew how to do that and minimize the collateral damage to the surrounding area. And he had the right tools. His knife was sharp because he knew that a dull knife was more dangerous to use, and so he sharpened it regularly. As a matter of fact, as I would learn to trust him, it became much easier to just go to him and let him help get that splinter out. And I remember that it didn't take long for all the kids. You get a splinter and you go running in the house, and now you're running right by mom and granny. They're going, what's wrong? And you just reply, nothing, I got to see grandpa. Because you knew he was going to help make it better. I think this is something we should strive for, not avoid. Now, should we be humbled and fearful at this task? Absolutely. But we should also be honored that the work of the Spirit is evident in our life to such a point that somebody feels comfortable listening and seeking your advice because they think that somehow their life, their relationship with Christ could be restored through you ministering to them. And I am convinced that if we are all willing to go through this restoration process, if we're willing to experience this cleansing that can take place, then our relationships will grow. They will grow strong, and they will do so through something that is only possible through the work of the Spirit in our life. You see, Christ made restoration possible for all of us through repentance, confession, and the waters of baptism. 
we have been extended grace and mercy and forgiveness. And if we are serious about becoming like Christ, then we also will be about restoring each other. We will be intentional in helping each other uh, identify and cut out the sin in our life. And the challenging part is we will welcome. We will welcome the person that comes to us in a spirit of gentleness to help us remove the sin from our life. So I leave you with this. My prayer is that we will all welcome the process of restoration in our life. That we will welcome the opportunity to help a brother and sister and that we will even welcome when somebody comes to us and says, we need to talk. Let's encourage each other right now as we stand and sing. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the 